What is Paul going to tell us about righteousness? That's what we're going to find out in Romans 2. So here's the important thing to understand, and I've mentioned it before, that these chapter marks are not (laughs) God-breathed. These are people who decided how to split up the chapters. And so there are places where these are continuing thoughts. There's no break in this thought. This is a letter. I mean, imagine this. You're living in Rome, and all of a sudden this delivery dude comes running by and hands you this letter, and you're sitting there reading this probably in one go. This is one big letter. And so where chapter one and chapter two breaks off, please don't think of it as a change of thought. This is the same thought. So here we go. Now he goes on to give some excuses about excuses. You know, who has excuses for uh, judging, for passing judgment, condemning yourself, or condemning other people? And we, he says right away, you know what? Quote, we know that judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things, that God is the judge and he's the one who's going to be doing this. That was ESV, by the way. And Even harsher, he says, for the people who judge other people and then still do those things, you can't escape judgment. And maybe you think that you've escaped judgment in your own ways, and it's not true because you do these things yourself. We, in the end, are all hypocrites. We think we're living the right way, and that other person over there, they're living the wrong way. And he says that, you know, you have to understand the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, patience. Those are the three words. Is meant for us to get repentance, that God has done all these things for us so that we would be saved. But instead, we are hard. We have impenitent hearts. We, we're not asking for forgiveness. And we're storing up this wrath for the day that God is going to do his judgment. And he's going to, it says, render each according to his works. Now, this word gets confusing. And a lot of people I saw in the commentaries were saying that it, they wish that that wasn't the phrase it was said because it has led to thousands of years of misunderstanding what it is we have to do to seek eternal life. And even worse, having people who are in powerful positions withholding salvation from people because they didn't think they worked hard enough. Because he says that, you know, for those people, he will give eternal life not those who are self-seeking or disobey. They'll get wrath and fury and tribulation and distress for everyone who does evil. We are not saved by the works we do, period, end of story. What he is saying is that faith shows through in the ways we are. Imagine if you were to get married and you said, oh, I love my, my husband. I love that if you were to say, I love my husband, And then you do everything to tear that man down. Where's your love showing? Where are you actually acting on that love? It's not that we have to do works in order to be saved, but because we are saved, because we have put our trust, patience, love in and following Jesus, we will do works because it will be made apparent. So, like I said, a lot of commentaries were lamenting that passage because we do not need to do works in order to be saved. And if any pastor tells you, well, you have to do this before you can be saved, if it's a work, it's wrong. God's forgiveness of sin is because of his patience, his forbearance, and we are led to be repentant because of that. Repentance again, repent, turn back, change your mind. He says, the Jew first and then also the Gentile, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. It it means that we do those things because we are following God and he has forgiven us our sins. He says at the very end, God shows no partiality, which is the point of all of this. It doesn't matter if you're Greek, Roman, Jewish, barbarian, you're one of those Celts living off in the top of England or one of the Franks living in France, wherever you are, you are forgiven because of Jesus. If you don't deny his forgiveness, his gift, and don't be arrogant, don't be unforgiving. Instead, we should treat each other like God has treated us 
with forgiveness, understanding, and not arrogance. Pride, you know, is such a big sin because it leads us to believe that we don't need God, that we don't need the forgiveness other people do. Well, I'm doing things pretty darn well. I'm doing pretty great. That person over there is pretty horrible, but I'm doing awesome. So what God is saying is that same kind of tolerance, patience, love that that God shows us, we should be showing to other people. And he does this because he is a loving God. He loves us. And there is no Jew or Greek, you know, Gentile, anything like that. God has no person that he treasures more than anyone else. And if you find yourself thinking, I am more treasured than that person over there, arrogance. Or likewise, if you are thinking, oh, that person's wonderful. I'm just such a horrible person. That is not what God is saying either. We have all sinned because that's where it comes in next. For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. And for all who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So either way, you are, are in this trap of sin. You are sinning either because you don't know the law or you're sinning because you do know the law and you do it anyway. There's all sorts of analogies that I heard that were pretty great about this. Um, the pastor at Calvary Church, Ontario, was talking about it as a scale that you can step on a scale and it's going to tell you what you weigh. And you can say, no, 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 I had a salad yesterday. I don't weigh this much. Sorry, the scale is always honest. I thought of more of like a a mirror, you know, that's an honest mirror that you can't get away with it. You know, you can't say, well, no, no, no. I, I see this image I have of myself in the mirror, but that's not true. First of all, I have blonde hair. Second of all, I weigh a lot less. No, the mirror is just showing you who you really are. And that's what the law does is that when you have that law, it is going to basically put a measuring tape right up to you and measure you. So either way, whether you've heard it, you've not heard it, you're not following it, and everybody is condemned in that same way. And it says that the Gentiles don't know the law. They don't have the law, they, but they're still, it's still required of them. And it says they are a law to themselves, even though they don't have the law. And it was important in the translations when you look at it, it's not just law. This isn't just rules. This is the law, the ultimate law, the ultimate rules of how our lives are supposed to be going. But he says that the the law is written in our hearts and our, our conscience and it bear witnesses to it. But even though it's written in the hearts of everybody, of every human being, or the people who know the law, they can literally see it. On the day of the final judgment, God will judge, it says, the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, by Christ Jesus. What are the secrets of men? Look, I can look at a person and I say, oh, look at that person over there. They're sinning by punching that person. They have anger. I can witness sin going on. I don't know what's on in people's hearts. I don't know why they're doing it. Is that person beating that other person up because that person harmed his child? I, you know, I don't know. But God knows the secrets of men, which means he knows what's at that final core layer of their heart. He understands that particular piece. And then he starts splitting people up into groups to talk about them because I think they each have their own sets of attributes. So he says, if you're a Jew and you rely on the law and boast in God because you know his will and you, you know, you think you know what's excellent because you're instructed, you're educated. He knows this one better than anything because he's that guy. He was the guy who was educated among one of the best teachers in Jerusalem. He knew everything. And that's where we saw in the Gospels, Jesus really, you know, taking people to task. You think you know everything, you Pharisees, but instead you're making up rules. You're not following the rules. You're whitewashed tombs. You tell people not to divorce their wives and you're divorcing your wife. You're doing everything that you say not to do because you're making your own excuses. And Paul's saying that too. You're a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, but a foolish. You think, I'm a guide. I'm teaching people. I'm educating them on what they should be doing. And he says that, you know, you think you're an instructor to the foolish or a teacher of children. 
and you know you embody everything that's true. But why didn't you teach yourself? That's where he asks the question. While you preach against stealing, did you steal? When you said you shouldn't commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And it says that when you abhor idols, do you rob temples? So he's saying, you know, you, all of you, particularly the Pharisees, you are saying these are the standards and then you're doing them anyway. And that is breaking the law. The, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You are giving this horrible example. You know, people are walking around going, that person's not a believer in God. Look at his life. He's stealing money from the temple. He's ratting out his fellow believers. I mean, you know, think about all the people who hauled Paul in front of the Romans. Do you think the Romans are going, what good witnesses they are to this God they have? Nope. But they're thinking, yeah, they're just a bunch of earthly jerks like we are who use crime and punishment and violence for their own being, just like we do. We steal, they steal. It's not. So that's a bad example, right? And this circumcision, you think you're obeying the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So you're doing all these things. You're following all these rules that you think will get you closer to God. But when you don't do the thing that you're supposed to do, you have undone the covenant. That's what he's saying. If you, circumcision was a sign of the covenant and now you are uncircumcised because you broke the law, you broke the covenant. You think you have a covenant with God, but you broke it. Circumcision is a matter of the heart, of the spirit. And it says, his praise is not from man, but from God. Jesus said that too. You're washing your hands. You're eating the proper food, but it is not what goes into your throat, your gullet, that makes you unpure. And that ends chapter two. What I'm going to meditate on is this idea that Paul takes it even further. that he talks about that you think you're doing all these things, these actions, and yet you are still sinning against God. I think each of us think, well, at least I'm not sleeping around. At least I don't steal people's stuff. At least I don't do X, Y, and Z. And it makes us arrogant. And it makes us think that we can be teachers. You know, let me teach you about God because I'm not the person who goes around stealing things and sleeping around with other people. You get pridefulness in that. And instead you are breaking sin. But as far as, but even farther than that, you are breaking the covenant that God signed with his people. Sin is deadly. And we can't boast on anything. We can't call ourselves righteous. We can't call ourselves better. We can't call ourselves better because we didn't have the law. I wasn't a Christian. Maybe you were never Jewish or Christian. I never had the law. I never had any law. I didn't break anything because I didn't know about anything. Or perhaps you did. And either way, you are still subject to the law, whether you knew it or not. And what I'm going to pray for is obviously forgiveness from all of these things. We do them all the time. And, you know, you'll run into people, you know, people who say, well, I haven't sinned. I, have, I haven't done anything. I, I don't treat my neighbors poorly. I'm kind to everyone. I think I was kind of in that boat a little bit because I'm kind of a nice person and I like to be nice to people. And so I don't sin. I haven't harmed anyone in any way. But then when you look back, you know, there are times when you didn't speak as kindly to someone. You didn't talk as kindly to your parents as you should have. You didn't give oh, someone that grace that you should have given them and, and some faith and understanding and forgiveness and all those things. We don't recognize our own sin, but yet we have to understand we do it all the time, even if it's not these big bang, uh, splashy sins, right? So. I'm going to pray for forgiveness of all of that. And what I'm going to share with others is that fact that really no one can have any sort of boasting, have any sort of arrogance about it, because it doesn't matter whether you're under the law and being Jewish or outside the law because you didn't know, because you lived in a different part of the world, you weren't of any sort of faith, your parents didn't tell you about Christianity. How were you supposed to know that there was a God in heaven? We're still subjected to those laws. And even us who are Christians now or people who grew up in the church, we also sin against them too. And in probably similar ways, 
that the Pharisees and the Sadducees sinned against it as well. Everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. We got some tough chapters going on here. And I did a lot of research on these commentaries because these were deep. Was it like, you know, Mark went over here and Peter went over there. But instead, boy, Paul is really giving Romans a real instruction on exactly what sin, forgiveness, grace, power of God, all of that. And I appreciate you listening. Please remember that you can go to a better life in small steps.com. My friend writes a blog there. It is a very positive, happy, enjoying life better. And she writes a very lovely blog. You can find her two blogs and all of my podcasts on that website. So I hope you check it out. And please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thanks so much.